Hi folks um, and welcome to my session on the principles of regenerative agriculture. My name is Nikki Oxall um, and I'm absolutely delighted to be able to present this session to you um, for the Scottish Smallholder Festival. Um, I hope it's interesting. I am by no means an expert in this but it's something that I'm enjoying learning about. Um, we're on the journey ourselves of developing our regenerative agriculture practice and uh, I just love the opportunity to talk to other people about it and share share it with other people. So um, a little bit about us. We are based in Aberdeenshire, North East Scotland. Um, this is the view from our paddock uh, up the River Deverin. Um, so we are in a really beautiful spot and it can be pretty extreme weather um, during the winter. Um, if you follow the river and continue along that valley, you eventually reach the Cairngorm. So it can be pretty, um, pretty rough during the winter. The weather can get pretty uh, extreme. So we have taken an approach to have native cattle who are hardy. Uh, we keep them outside all year round. And uh, we, we really enjoy kind of the experience of grazing um, our livestock in a way that we hope is regenerative and that doesn't uh, degrade soils. So I'm going to be talking very much from a livestock point of view during the session, um, but I'm also aware that there'll be lots of people who uh, are more focused maybe on crops and plants. So I'll be trying to talk a little bit about that, but primarily my my interest is in, is in livestock. Uh, I also, just to say that I work... Um, a couple of roles that I have. Uh, one is with the Pasture Fed Livestock Association um, and I'm involved in their kind of research work and I'm particularly interested and a great believer in pasture fed animals. You know I don't I don't believe that it makes sense for us to grow crops to feed to animals when actually they're perfectly suited to get everything they need from from what they can graze. And I also have a role with the Nature Friendly Farming Network as their sustainable farming lead in Scotland. And I would really recommend that if you haven't heard of the PFLA or the NFFN, that you look both of them up and you look to potentially becoming a member. Um, you can join the PFLA as a supporter for free and you can join the NFFN for free as well and get access to lots of information and opportunities. So that's my plug done for the session. Um, and let's talk a little bit about regenerative agriculture. So... This is very much about principles to guide action on any scale. So it doesn't matter whether you've got 10,000 acres or half an acre. It's about principles, not practices. So what are the guiding um, aims that you can work to to enable you to be more regenerative in what you're doing? The first one is about optimising photosynthesis. So the more photosynthesis that we have, um, the more healthy our plants and soils are. And I'm going to go into all of these in more detail as we go through. The second one is around ensuring year-round cover. So making sure we don't have bare soil. Bare soil is enemy number one. So in year-round cover is really, really important in terms of regenerating our soils and creating really healthy farm ecosystems. We want to reduce or optimise disturbance. So where we do have to um, disturb ground, where we do have to have a kind of impact, we want it to be as little as possible or carried out in a way that is for a function or a purpose and that enables um, the creation of a niche habitat, for example, or that does something for a purpose. So we don't just want to smash up the ground for the hell of it. We always want there to be a thought around what is the optimal disturbance on that piece of land. We want to increase above and below ground biodiversity and biomass. So we want a diverse range of plants and animals and we want high numbers of those. So that uh, below ground biodiversity can be all sorts of different soil biology, um, thing, and it, you know things like earthworms, nematodes, um, all different types of bugs and crawlies that live under the ground, but we want lots of them. So we want that mass there as well. And this also relates to plant diversity and plant mass above the ground. And we need to consider action enabling factors. So these are the things that enable us to actually undertake this stuff, to farm or manage our ground in a way that would be considered regenerative. And I've shamelessly stolen these from Nicole Masters, who is a phenomenal soil scientist and advocate of regenerative agriculture. And I would really recommend getting her book, um, For the Love of Soil, 
Uh, and if you get it as the audio book, it's fantastic because she narrates it in her lovely New Zealand uh, accent. Um, and it's just full of information. So um, I, I think I've kind of stolen a few of her ideas for this presentation. So um, really would recommend uh, learning a bit more about her if you haven't heard of Nicole already. And I've just um, captured here the carbon cycle. And this is something that's really, really important. And that carbon is in the news a lot at the moment. Um, it's quite often demonized, but carbon is vital for life. If we don't have carbon, we can't live. Um, and, you know, we, we need to think about how we promote it as a natural nutrient enabling cycle. We have a phenomenal uh, power in nature to capture sunlight through um, the, the, the mechanism of photosynthesis to pull down energy from the sun onto the earth that then goes through a range of uh, processes to give further energy to the plants, to the animals, to the soil, to us, um, and enables all of these things to happen through respiration, um, through the exudates, so the, the sugary good stuff that goes from the soil into the ground. It's a really complex system and we very much get carried away with talking about reducing carbon emissions and enabling carbon sequestration. But we mustn't forget that the carbon cycle has been there a long, long time before we were there with our greenhouse gas emissions. And that a healthy cycle is really, really key to enabling um, effective regenerative agricultural practice. I'm going to touch a little bit on holistic management because holistic management can be considered part of the um, toolkit, if you like, around regenerative agriculture. And it's something that we very much um, prescribe to. Um, my husband and I um, are both really interested in holistic management and are undertaken uh, training. And there's some very kind of key um, principles, if you like, of holistic management. I won't go into loads of detail, but I really recommend um, reading holistic management um, book by Alan Savory and Jodie Butterfield. And there's loads of stuff on YouTube as well to look at if you're interested. But the key part of this approach is that nature functions in holes. So we need to think all the time about that, the wholeness of what we do. What we do in one field impacts on another field. What we do with our animals might impact on our plants. How we treat our soil impacts on our own personal health. So everything impacts on everything else. And we need to think about that when we're making changes or doing things differently on our farms. The processes within the ecosystem, so ecosystem processes are central to regenerative agriculture. So these are the water cycle, the mineral cycle, energy flow. So what I talked about a minute ago, you know, the sun's energy coming down to the ground and then community dynamics. So how the different communities within that in ecosystem interact. We need to think about defining what it is we're managing for. Are we managing purely for productivity? Are we managing for cost efficiency? Are we managing for ecosystem health? So whatever we're managing for, it's really important that we define that and we're very clear on what it is that our end goals are. In terms of grazing particularly, time is more important than numbers of animals. I hear time and time again people talking about stock densities and extensive conservation grazing. But, you know, one animal can overgraze um, a field. I see it all the time with horses, for example. And what's really important is time. So the amount of time that an animal spends in a field is going to be more important than how many animals are in there, whether it's one animal, 10, 100, 10,000. Because the longer an animal is in a field, the more it can go back and overgraze what it's already grazed. However, if you have 100 animals in a field, but you only keep them in there for a few hours or a day, then they're limited as to how much they can actually go and overgraze a plant that has already been eaten. And I'm going to go into a bit more detail about this idea around time in a second when I talk about mob grazing later on in this presentation. Holistic management also recommends that we test our decisions. So rather than just deciding that we're suddenly going to go and buy 20 sheep, we need to run it against a number of tests to check that it's the right thing for our whole farm plan and that it won't destroy or uh, negatively affect our ecosystem processes. And it also recommends that we monitor our results, that we don't just do things and carry on willy nilly without thinking about the impact, that we need to be measuring and recording and monitoring what we're doing. And that doesn't have to involve lots of spreadsheets. It can just be um, 
what you're seeing, so observing. And your phone camera is your absolute number one friend in that. Taking pictures from the same places as you go through the year, being able to go back and compare them, thinking about what you're seeing and what that means and the impact of the decisions you've had really is key. So coming back to the, the key um, principles of uh, regenerative agriculture as defined by Nicole Masters. I'm going to go through each of these and I wish that there was a way that I could have more images to share with you, but I'm very conscious of our time and I want to try and keep, um, want to try and keep this kind of within time. Um, and I do have images here, but there's just so much to go through. It's a huge topic. So half an hour to talk about regenerative agriculture is a very short period of time. So I'm just going to dip into some of these thoughts for you. So optimising photosynthesis. The more photosynthesis we have, the more carbon sequestration we have, which means healthy plants, soils and healthy nutrient cycles. If we have healthy animals, we have healthy people, if we're meat eaters, for example. But if we are directly eating plants, as long as we've got more photosynthesis, we'll have those healthy plants and we will derive the health and nutritional benefits from them ourselves. Each leaf is a solar panel. We need to think of every single plant as being covered in these solar panels, which are the leaves. So the more leaves we have, the more photosynthesis. Thus, reducing the overgrazing risk means that we can maintain more leaves above ground. So the idea of a back fence ensures this grass recovery. If you put your animals into a field and they graze halfway across the field and you put up an electric fence to stop them going back to where they've been, you're immediately building in the opportunity for that grass to recover. So the more you control where your animals are grazing, the more you can control the recovery of the grass. When an animal eats um, a clump of grass, that grass then, that plant, is stimulated to grow back. And in order to, to, in order to grow, it needs to put sugars into the plant so that it's got the energy to, to regrow. Now, the minute those sugars go into those leaves to help the plant regrow, it suddenly becomes very, very tasty to the animals again. So the palatability of that plant increases which means cattle, for example, or sheep, are more likely to regraze what they've already grazed because it's sweeter, it's more sugary, it's like us going back and eating cake instead of eating cabbage. So if we stop them from regrazing the areas they have already grazed, we reduce the risk of the reduction of these solar panels. So stopping animals from eating too much grass in a particular area means that we keep that photosynthesis happening because we're keeping those leaves open and available to the sun to capture that sunlight. The second point is ensuring year round cover. So ground cover equals soil armour. Plants are phenomenal at holding water, keeping that soil in place, reducing the risk of erosion reducing runoff, which means reduced nutrient loss and soil degradation. If you look at this photo at the bottom of the slide, you can see on the left hand side, we've got bare soil that's been ploughed and cultivated. And on the right hand side, we have got a cover crop. So this is a plant, this has been planted to help improve the soils. If we have um, a heavy rainfall event, which we're seeing more and more of now, we're seeing that climate change and we're seeing uh, you know, greater, more impactful rain events. If that happens to fall on that field, where it hits the bare soil, the raindrops will smash into the ground, they'll break apart the soil structure, they will, water then will collect and it will carry away with it as it runs downhill soil particles, um, it will dissolve soluble nutrients and it would just take away all of the good stuff that's sitting in that soil into that ditch and away it will run. However, if we keep a nice cover crop on top of our ground, when the rain hits that, it'll be dispersed. So the energy of the rain will be dispersed by the leaves. And as such, when the water hits the ground, it won't be with such force. When it then seeps into the ground and starts to um, go down into the soil structure, it will be absorbed by the roots because the plants need water to grow. And all the roots that are in there, so even if that soil becomes really sodden and the plants can't take up any more water, 
the fact those roots are there will hold that soil in place. So there are some fantastic videos. If you um, are on Twitter, for example, I'd really recommend following a guy called um, Niels Caulfield. He has got some fantastic videos on his um, on his Twitter feed and through his website, which demonstrate the ability of plants covered ground to infiltrate water and to hold water and to keep the water in there. So the more grassy stuff, plants, whatever it is, crops that we have on the ground all year round, the less likely we are to lose our soils. Using cover crops, living mulches. So if you're in your um, growing vegetables, putting in living mulches like mustards and things that will help to protect the soil. Managing our grazing to reduce bare patches. Again, what we don't want Bare soil is enemy number one. We want to reduce the amount of bare soil on our ground. So ensuring that year-round cover really helps to maintain healthy plants, healthy soils. I've just got a few images here. Now, this is two of our, our two heifers, Beth and Betty, of the wee mob. Um, and this was just to show you bale grazing. So lots of folk will put their bales on end, like a bean can, in their ring feeders. And what you inevitably see around a ring feeder is poached mud. Um, it becomes sloppy and wet. It holds the water. The cattle are up to their knees and hocks in it. Um, it's not a pretty sight. And the amount of destruction that's happening to that soil, it's limited capacity to regrow and to be healthy when it's completely waterlogged and destroyed like that really isn't beneficial. So we've been testing out the idea of bale grazing. Um, and we manage how much the cattle can eat by the use of the electric fence. You can probably see that in the bottom right picture um, that we've put the fence up so they can only eat so much of it. And yes, you can see in that same photo that Betty there is standing in the hay. And some people might think of that as a waste. But the amount of organic matter that is being pushed back into the ground there. So it's, uh, it's doing two jobs. One, it's holding her up, which means that as she's eating, she's not then... Um, poaching the ground so it's protecting it's giving some cover to the ground it's protecting it from um, from being destroyed by her feet and then any trampling she is doing that hay is being pushed into the ground and it's enabling um, soil organic matter to be formed so it, as the hay breaks down it adds to the organic matter in the soil which increases its ability to hold carbon and lock carbon in and the more organic matter that you find in your soils, the healthier your soils are. So this particular area is, can get quite waterlogged um, and it has um, quite um, acidic soil. So we've been trying to increase the amount of organic matter here to try and create a more diverse ward so that it's not just rushes and it's not just tufted grasses, but we also then use this diverse seeded um, hay to try and increase different seeds into the seed bank there. Some people would say that the waste, um, there's a cost implication, but the amount of hay that gets wasted, if you like, though I never see it as waste, um, from a bale like this, if you break it down into cost, you'd have to waste, I think we worked out something like um, at the cost of a ring feeder compared to the cost of bales, you'd have to waste a hell of a lot of bales to offset the cost of buying a ring feeder. And then the cost um, of the soils and the degradation to the soils, I would absolutely say that this approach really, really has worked for us. We also put bales up as bale pods. So we put them on end um, and put them in kind of an open square shape. So not only do they um, give fodder to the cattle, but they also create some protection as well for outwintering. So the next principle that I want to touch on is the idea of reducing and optimising disturbance. So natural processes create disturbance, which create the appropriate niches for animals and plants to thrive. So if you think of an ecosystem as lots of little pockets, each of those pockets produces the home for an animal or a plant to live in with the perfect conditions for that animal or plant to be successful. If we have too much disturbance, that leads to degraded soils. So ploughing, for example, if we plough a field, it's a little bit like somebody coming to your house, turning it upside down and asking you to get on with your daily life without batting an eyelid. Ploughing is doing the same thing to the soil. Turning it upside down is completely throwing all of the plant, the 
uh, biology that lives, you know, in the subsoil up onto the top and asking it just to carry on functioning in its soil. So that disturbance really does lead to that degraded soil. And obviously the ploughing then creates bare earth. And we've already established that that's enemy number one. So we want to make sure that disturbance is reduced. But too little can reduce the mosaic nature of an ecosystem and leave some animals and plants without a niche as others take over. So I think bracken, for example. On our land here, we have bracken growing on some of the slopes, which is absolutely fine because it does produce um, a, a niche that other animals can really um, thrive in. But as it starts coming into our pasture, if we don't manage it in some way and create some level of disturbance, it potentially could take over from some of the other more diverse swords that we've got there, things like um, our different grasses, we've got lots of different vetches, um, all sorts of different plants um, and flowers like oxide daisies, we have got um, ragged robin. So all of these things would be um, swamped out, if you like, if we didn't in some way disturb that bracken. So some disturbance, such as minimum tillage to sow seeds and reduced cultivation in terms of harvesting, taking an adaptive grazing approach to reduce poaching and ensure water infiltration remains effective. These are all ways that we can Im uh, implement this kind of reduced, optimised disturbance. And again, this is where it comes to not having clear, this is what you have to do when you're regeneratively um, farming. But these are things that we need to think about. So if you realise that actually an area has got really poached, well, there's not a lot you can do about it at that point. But being aware of it and then coming back to think about your ecosystem processes, considering that in the wholeness of your ecosystem allows you to then make those changes so that going forward, it's not having such a negative impact on your ground. So as I mentioned just in that last slide, adaptive grazing is something that can be used to manage the disturbance. So the top left photo, you'll see two of our Shetlands. Um, they are currently in that photo um, being mob grazed, but it's also silver pasture. So it's a wooded um, area that they're in. And even though that grass is lovely and lush, they're far more interested in browsing the trees. Huge amounts of nutrients in trees for cattle to access and allows us not to have to use any external inputs like mineral licks, for example. And also means that we're more able to um, reduce our need for any sort of wormer as well, along with faecal egg counts to, to check that that is the case. Just to the right of the, the, the black cow on the right in that photo, you'll see a little white stick um, with black bits on it and that's one of our electric fencing posts um, and we create these paddocks that the cattle go into which means that they're in a paddock and it sometimes could be for a day it could be for half a day it could be for two days never ever really more than two days and what happens then is that they eat the grass and as I talked about a little bit earlier in the session they then don't come back and regraze we're managing the grazing, we're managing the impact, there is a certain amount of disturbance. If the weather suddenly turns and it becomes very wet, we move them more quickly, so we get them off the ground so that they're not disturbing it so much, and we move them through those grazing pallets a bit quicker. And if it dries out, we might slow it down a little bit because we know that they'll have less negative impact on the ground. In the bottom right photo, you can see our white galloways. And this was some ground that we took on this year that had been overstocked and overgrazed um, for many, many years. So it's not in the best condition, but we've been working hard this year to take a more regenerative approach to how we manage it. Again, using electric fencing has meant that we've been able to move these cattle around the field, always making sure that what's behind them is resting and we're be, being able to plan our grazing to make sure that we always have plenty of grass for them. So the idea of mob grazing really, really is, um, is about controlling the impact that the animals are having through trampling and eating. You're not keeping them where their manure is, which massively reduces the risk of parasite burden. You're giving them a fresh bite every day or so, which means that their nutrient um, level is maintained rather than dipping over time. Because as cattle overgraze or sheep overgraze, the nutrient benefit from the grass that they're grazing reduces. But you can keep it nice and high and it's more consistent if you're moving them onto fresh grass more regularly. If you're really interested in mob grazing, I would really recommend um, just 
Googling it and there's so much out there. But the Soil Association in Scotland have set up a mob grazing field lab of which we are members. And there's lots of resources being developed at the moment on social media um, through Soil Association Scotland and the pasture power hashtag if you're interested. Um, and on the 2nd of November, there's a Facebook live Q&A session um, with myself and two other much bigger scale mob graziers um, who are going to be talking more about the kind of uh, Q&As of, you know, and the, the FAQs of, of mob grazing and how it works for us. So coming back then to our principles, the next one is about increasing above and below ground biodiversity and biomass. The more diversity, the better. And I think that probably relates to most things, not just agriculture. But soils need diversity of plants and animals to thrive. Everything has a function. So increasing that diversity whilst meeting the other principles will always lead to healthier farm systems. We want to see multiple crops, multiple species swords ruminants followed by poultry for example so if you can stack your animals if you like so you might have your cows grazing through on your mob grazing a few days later follow them with your sheep potentially a few days later follow them with your chickens and a chicken tractor and if you don't know what a chicken tractor is go and look it up um, and you will then see that actually the diversity of the animals they all graze in a different way they impact the ground in a different way and that diversity can lead to increased plant diversity um, above ground and increased diversity not in just in terms of the nutrients below ground but the um, underground uh, biology as well so really see that the more that complex your systems are actually um, the the more healthy and resilient they are if you think about a monocrop or a monoculture field, you know, a field full of just barley and nothing else, you know, that is so um, lacking in resilience. We get horrendous weather. It's all just going to get flattened and lodged. And then it's really, really difficult to harvest. However, if you had different um, strips of different uh, crops in a field of differing heights, for example, they could be protected by um, taller plants during um, rain events. And it might be possible then to um, ensure that you've got more diverse um, root systems and inter interconnectivity between the different plants, which mean that they're more resilient to different um, nutrient losses or nutrient uh, lacking in the soil, and actually they're able to support each other more. So agroforestry, silver pasture, which is uh, integrating animals and trees, or silver arable, integrating trees and crops, um, is a great example of how you can kind of combine and create more diversity in a particular area to produce that resilience that will enable us to have um, financially and uh, environmentally sustainable farms in the future. So I talked a little bit about um, kind of the underground um, communities. So you can see this is us doing some soil testing. Um, right hand photo also has a spaniel foot in it. I was trying to work out what that was earlier and then realised one of our dogs was with us when we were doing this soil testing. So and it again comes back to that idea of monitoring and checking. So we look for soil that is like a chocolate cake. So it's crumbly. The, the clod that we've taken out of the soil, the ground on the left, um, looks a bit compacted there but actually it's where the, the spade's gone through and we just put in quite a sort of cut and then had to lever it out um, but you can see on the right hand side the soil is really crumbly there's lots of roots in there um, we were doing earthworm counts as well so we were seeing how many worms were living in there and you know the more air flow that you can get through your soil by the deeper the roots grow then then the better because air air um Holes for air also allow water to come through as well. And finally, Nicole Masters talks about this considering action enabling factors. So these are the things that allow us to work towards the other principles. And it's mostly, I've got to be honest, mindset. Nicole talks about the um, five M's. So management, minerals, organic matter, microbes and mindset. And these are the five factors that um, enable us to take action. So thinking about our management, considering our mineral imbalances and what our animals and our plants require, how we build organic matter into our soil, how we promote and give life to our microbes and our mindset that we um, that we approach this with. You know, regenerative agriculture isn't an add on. It's a it's a whole system approach um, to be applied in kind of local contexts where the farmer is the expert. 
but it requires farmers and crofters and land managers to be educated so that they can make observations that then impact the management to address any of these limiting factors. You know, biodiversity isn't just for biodiversity. It gives food for microbes. And fertilizer isn't, you know, thinking about fertilizer and how we use and apply fertilizer really then needs to come back to thinking about the natural processes, the minerals, the organic matter. And then we can make refinements and we can tweak and adjust as we need to. So the conclusions are here that it's a journey. You can't just be regenerative. It's about going beyond conservation and beyond sustainability. Why would we want to conserve or sustain, conserve or sustain something which isn't thriving and isn't as alive as it could be? So regenerating is about putting life back into our soils and into our farms and our crofts. We need to think about the wholeness of our farm or our small holding or our croft. It's not just about what I want to do and what I'm going to achieve and I've got 10 acres therefore I can have 10 cows or whatever you know it's thinking about whatever I do has an impact elsewhere and on other systems and other ecosystems beyond our land that we're managing you know we're all in different river catchment areas so everything that we do potentially has an impact on the health of those rivers and those streams and those lochs mindset really is the key challenge and I would say that the biggest a way of addressing that is connecting with people who are interested and who can help you and who want to support you. The more people you have around you who are interested in this stuff, the more that you can ask questions and feel like you're part of a community. I really recommend Twitter um, for kind of exploring regenerative agriculture. It's been phenomenal for us to make connections with people who we've been to see and who we really now have become good friends with. Um, I, on my how mill so at how mill account um have a list a twitter list of ag inspo so people that i'm inspired by um so that's might be a good place to go as a starting point if you're looking for um interesting people to follow and i guess having that community around you also helps you to learn that mistakes are fine you know you're either successful or you learn so you know failure doesn't really happen it's always about making sure that you're learning from anything that goes wrong and there really is so much to learn and so many great resources available. Um, if you're new to all of this, I really recommend looking at people like Joel Salatin and Gabe Brown and Charles Massey, Nicole Masters, who I already, already talked about, um, all of whom are in either America or Australia, New Zealand. But there are loads of people doing regenerative stuff in the UK in their own way, on their own farms, um, you know, who are just testing things out and trying things and seeing how it works. So, you know, there really is so much opportunity out there to connect with people, to try things, to test things. Um, and I've just decided to finish with a gratuitous photo of our beautiful wee mob um, in the birch woods nearby, near our home. Um, and I hope this has been of interest to you. And I'm always keen to have um, to answer questions, to have chats with people about this sort of stuff. So if there's anything that you want to connect with me on, um, you can get in touch with me via Twitter. So at How Mill, H-O-W-E-M-I-L-L. -L. Or um, if you contact the organisers then they of the event, they can give you my email address. Um, and I'm more than happy for that to be shared so that you can contact me directly. Um, and I'm, you know, as I said, always happy, particularly wearing my PFLA or Nature Friendly Farming Network hat to talk to groups, to come and discuss these sorts of things with people um, and just open up the conversation. So thanks ever so much for taking part. Um, and I really do look forward to hearing from you, hopefully in the future.